Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. As many of you know, I do like to speak to fellow former Jehovah's Witnesses. I have one with me today who's agreed to be interviewed. His name, Oliver Robler. Hello, Oliver. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Lloyd. Thank you for having me. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You actually did, yes. Wow. Very good. <laughs> I don't you even nailed say it. it first that. time. <laughs> So that's the first part done. Um, I'm fascinated to hear more about your story. You've obviously uh, been impacted by the Jehovah's Witness religion, as have many of us. Yes. Uh, how did you first get involved? Yeah, so I was in my early 20s, and I had this neighbor who was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I used to come in contact with her every now and then, and she would talk to me about um, different things and about Jehovah, and all these different subjects. And so I was probably about 22 years old and I was about to go to police academy out in California. And she basically said, you know, we've been talking about this for years. I had like two months before I was supposed to leave. She said, why don't you have a study? And you what's know what's the worst like, that could happen? Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> so um, there was also um, a cute brunette that I did know about and who was friends with her. And I'd have to say that that probably uh, kept me searching a little bit longer than I would have. Uh, she ended up becoming my wife so um, yeah that's kind of how I I first got started okay so ago. this cute brunette was a friend of the person who'd offered you a bible study that's correct yep. and you you knew them to be a Jehovah's Witness I did yeah I had met her a few times um, my parents had a restaurant uh, right in this little town and so my friend who offered me to study um would also invite this cute Burnett in. And uh, so I talked to her several times at my parents' place. Okay. Yep. Well, no judging here. Um, <laughs> when we're in our 20s, these are the sorts of uh, factors that come into play. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, mm -hmm. you know, because routinely you'll hear people say, well, it's one thing to join the Jehovah's Witnesses because you've been indoctrinated into it from childhood, but how could any thinking adult with critical thinking skills actually accept this nonsense? Right. Um, so how do you kind of reflect on that question? Well, for me, what the few things that I did learn in the very beginning, you know, were very interesting to me. I had gone to Catholic school for a time. Uh, my parents, you know, would take us to church on Easter and Christmas. And so I learned more in the first month, really in the first couple of weeks, than I felt I had ever learned in my whole life. So it did appeal to me, um, especially living on earth forever. That's one of the teachings that Jehovah's Witnesses have. And that captured my interest. Okay. Was there any kind of underlying, I mean, obviously I'm sensing that there was some religious background. In other words, it wasn't like an entirely blank canvas. They were just kind of right. uh, building on the work, on the groundwork that had already been put in, in terms of your, um, your flirtations with Catholicism. Yep. That's um, true. Yep. But uh, was there any kind of underlying issues, you know, from like from that made you maybe emotionally vulnerable, or was it purely, pure, purely a case of I like what these people are pitching? I think it was simply just that mm. um, the fact that um, I felt like I had learned so much in such a short period of time, and everything made so much sense. And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses open up the Bible and there's proof for everything that they say. And of course, now 28 years later, I know that those weren't actual proofs, but yeah. 
it was appealing to me as a young 20 year old. And then of course, as I said, having that interest in this young sister, um, when I, when maybe I would have said, you know, this is crazy. I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. I, I kept going. I kept mm. going. Yeah. She had, she had told me early on that, you know, she would not date me unless I was a witness. And when I first heard that, I thought, Oh my gosh, well, I'm, I'm never going to go door to door. So, but okay. as I went on, it just, there was even a time in, in the very beginning where she really kind of stopped our relationship and I wasn't baptized yet. And, but I enjoyed the study so much that I, I just kept on going and it really didn't matter to me, um, you know, what she was doing. Of course that, you know, that was maybe be maybe a couple weeks to a month and then we were back together. So I had that influence and I, I enjoyed what I was learning. Okay. Well, that, that tells me that's quite interesting because, you know, the fact that you, you know, soldiered on with it, even when it looked like, you know, your relationship was at an end, like right. you say, it says something for how kind of beguiling um, the beliefs were that you were being given. Um, and so uh, what happened next? You know, you, you must have got baptized. So uh, yeah, was, how did the reality of being a Jehovah's Witness affect you? Yeah. Yeah. So I studied for 10 months and I was baptized. I never did leave for police academy because, of course, this was uh, 1991. And by that time they weren't really recommending that you get into those types of jobs any longer, especially if you had to carry a firearm. And so I, you know, I, I got baptized after, after 10 months. And then six months later, uh, my ex-wife and I got married. So the realities of being one of Jehovah's witnesses I really fed into it all. Um, I didn't have any struggles. Um, I enjoyed what I was learning, but I wasn't a very good researcher. I was being fed, you know, I was being fed the information and I was eating it up. And I did that for 28 years. And of course, I, you know, was a ministerial servant and an elder eventually. And so it was really just my life at that point. You know, I, I think I actually got out of the whole situation, which was just a year ago, really. Um, I got out of the whole situation doing pretty well. And the reason I say that is, is because um, I have a 27 year old son and he, I was going to say follow, followed me out, but no, actually he was on his way out before I was. Um, but he, he's now, you know, living free just like I am. So that's a huge bonus because it could have been a lot worse. Uh, my marriage was not going well. Um, so I did, you know, I did lose a marriage mate. Um, but it could have been a lot worse. I think the other thing that helped me too was, was that none of my family were Jehovah's Witnesses. So I had a loving family to go to. I had my son who is also out. So in that way, I felt like, you know, I really could almost count my blessings, but I only wasted 28 years. <laughs> well, you've, you've taken us on, on a, kind of a whistle-stop tour of those 28 years. And I'm wondering if we might just kind of turn the car around and go back to uh, the, especially the part where, you know, you become a ministerial servant and an elder. Um, I've obviously been an elder, so I know a little bit what it's like, but I was only an elder for a year and I'm therefore sort of fascinated to learn more about what it's like in that particular position and, you know, what if any kind of standout experiences 
yeah. uh, people in that position may have had now that they're reflecting back on them from the position of having woken up. So right. how would you how would you describe your your experiences? You know, the whole process of reaching out for greater privileges and having the opportunity to become a ministerial servant and then later to become an elder. Um, I fed right into those things. Of course, my ego um, was very happy that I was getting the opportunity to do that. So it didn't take long. Um, I think pretty much right after I got baptized, um, I had responsibilities in the congregation. I wasn't a ministerial servant yet. But they were using me, and it felt good. It felt really good. Um, I would say probably within three years, I was made a ministerial servant. And again, it just um, at the time, it was a great experience. Um, the, the respect that you got from the others in the congregation, and even feeling like you're making a difference. And that you're, you know, that you're being productive and that you're helping others and you're helping the congregation. It just, it, it felt good. So I was a ministerial servant um, in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I got the, the uh, responsibility of scheduling the talks. And back then in that time, I don't know if you remember this, but I would contact other brothers from different congregations and kind of set uh, talks up and we'd trade, right? We'd take one of their speakers and we'd give them one of ours. Well, they'd always ask, well, what about you? Because that responsibility was usually always handled by an elder. And so what happened to me is, is because I was a ministerial servant and I was speaking to those brothers, they would say, what, what about you? Can you, can you come give a talk? And I said, well, I can, but you'd have to request me because I'm a ministerial servant. Well, we're requesting you. So I started giving talks and traveling um, as a ministerial servant. And I did that for years before I ever became an elder. So every step of the way, I just got more and more involved. And I you know, it, it just fed into my ego and, and, you know, like I said, just the, the respect that you got from fellow people in the congregation. And so um, I didn't have any, any qualms or doubts about the truth until much, much later. Um, eventually then, as I was in Flagstaff, I did get uh, made an elder. And again, very busy. Um, we had plenty to do. So how long me, were you an elder for? Um, I believe I was an elder for about three or four years. Yeah. And so um, we had since then we had moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And I had some conscience um, issues where I felt like I was involved in something where I really couldn't serve as an elder anymore. And um, so I did step down and um, all kinds of things basically happened, you know, in my family's life after that. Um, uh, it became very, very difficult and there was stress. And so I think that kind of started uh, just, you know, for instance, my son had been disfellowshipped. Um, he had been disfellowshipped twice. Now, as an ex-elder, I knew what the process was. I knew what the grounds were um, and how you got to that point of deciding whether someone was going to be disfellowshipped or not. And what I saw wasn't anything close to what I was taught as an elder and what I had learned. And so I was pretty angry. I was pretty angry. His disfellowshipping, when he went to reinstate himself, Lloyd, uh, or sent in a letter to ask for reinstatement, it had been about six months. And he had never missed a meeting. 
and he was completely involved as much as he possibly could be. He was still living at home at the time, so we were able to speak to him, um, which made things easier. But the process of him getting reinstated um, really started to, you know, me thinking about, you know, what was really going on and should these bro- should these brothers have that type of um, responsibility and were they really, what's the word I'm looking for, um, you know, were they were they really able to make those type of decisions and they were, were they doing it correctly? And in this case, they weren't. Um, you may remember that as elders were told there's, it's, it's not a sentence of a certain amount of time. It has to do with, um, is the person repentant? What are they doing to show, you know, different, you know, acts of repentance. And my son couldn't have been doing any more. Um, but before they even listened to him, when they, when they went to meet for a reinstatement meeting, they had said to him, we just want to let you know that it's only been six months. And of course my son, you know, told me this and, and I knew that that was incorrect and he was having a very, very hard time. Um, obviously not being able to speak to any of his friends, six months of isolation. He, he had, you know, he had some um, emotional struggles as it was, but then to be, you know, disfellowshipped and to not have any of that support or any of that, you know, friendship with his friends, um, he really struggled with it. We were worried for him. We thought, you know, that he might, do something. Uh, we, you know, we were worried about uh, suicide, and so basically, that got me on this this path of questioning whether these men in these congregations should ever have that type of power to be able to affect a young person's life or a, a grown adult, for that matter, because. They, they weren't even doing what they were trained to do. So they were, they're basically, they were just doing it the way they thought it should be done. And that's unacceptable. Was that, though, not a consideration for you when you actually were an elder? Because you say you spent about three and a half years as an elder. So did that thought not occur to you when you were an elder? And also... Were you involved in any judicial cases yourself as an elder? Yes, I was. And it's amazing, though, the difference in your thinking when you are an elder and you're, you know, you you may be involved in a judicial committee. And no, I didn't have any qualms. Now, using hindsight, I was unqualified. I didn't know what I was doing. Now, fortunately... I, the cases that I was involved in, they didn't result in a disfellowshipping. So um, I, I'm glad about that. I'm glad about that. But no, when you're going through it and you're an elder, you don't question it because you're told you're not perfect. You're just a man, you know, just the three of you, you know, brothers, you'll, you know, you work on it together and you'll come up with the right answer. Well, it's a, it's a lot you know, it, there's a lot more to it than that. But as an elder, you don't feel that, you know, that you're doing anything wrong. I never had those thoughts. So. And did you, when you were an elder, did you come up against any, um, any indication of any problems with child sexual abuse? I didn't. I didn't. I had heard about it. Um, over the years. And again, I was protected in my little cocoon. And we were always told, you know, don't listen to any outside source because they're always slanted and you don't hear the whole story. So you protected yourself. I, I didn't listen to any of that. And that's dangerous. Oh my goodness. I mean, and now, now that I'm, I'm free and I'm, and I'm out and I'm, you know, I, 
listen to different activists, including yourself, and, and I hear the stories. And I've done a little research. It is unbelievable things that have happened, um, especially with, you know, with um, child abuse issues. Yeah. Um, but we were we were told to to steer clear of that and to not listen, and so that's what we did. Very Certainly. Dangerous. Yeah, um, I, I can I can only vaguely recall um, meetings with circuit overseers where they'd they take you through these um, what if scenarios, wouldn't they? Meet, yeah. So they'd say, if if this happened, what would you do? And if this happened, what would you do? And whenever it was anything to do with child abuse, the correct answer was always call the branch office. Right. Know, so, don't yeah. comment. Don't. Yeah. Don't say anything. Yeah. And by the way, don't know anything either. Indeed. So you uh, finally are kind of forced to confront how unfair the whole judicial thing is in, yep. in the case of your son. Um, how how much further did that go uh, in terms of the rabbit hole and, and how did that resolve itself? Well, he was reinstated um, both times eventually. But each time was exactly a year. And that's just kind of laughable because we're always told that it has nothing to do with an amount of time. It has nothing to do with an amount of time, unless it's something publicly known and something reprehensible, right? Uh, then you may be disfellowshipped for years, although you're very repent for it, maybe. Um, so there are those circumstances, but that wasn't the case with my son. Mm. Um, his was not, you know, his issue was not known to anyone. And, and yet they waited for this magical year to pass by and it's written and published in so many different articles that it has nothing to do with an amount of time. We're not, we, we don't carry out sentences. Mm. You know, we're looking for, we're looking to extend mercy when possible. Uh, but that just wasn't the case. So, you know, that wore on me. And then I had another issue. And that was a good friend of mine who was an elder and a pioneer would get his haircut at my wife's place of business. And that's what she does. And he, he had watched a, a um, like one of her reps who, who would come in and sell her her products, right? Uh, he had watched her come in and she was a good looking woman. And he locked eyes on her and my wife noticed and she said, hey, what are you doing? You know, you're not supposed to do that. So he was gawping at her. Yeah, yeah, right. gawping okay. at her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, he he tells her that he would not mess up his life as an elder and a pioneer. And the words he used was, "I don't know if I can say this actually." <laughs> oh he really? Said, well, he said basically, "I wouldn't mess up my marriage and my responsibilities and everything else for a piece of." Ass. Oh right. 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 And when he did that, he took his hand and he patted my wife on her tush. So just, you know, within the congregation and within the acceptable behaviors, uh, that certainly wasn't one of them. Mm. Um, my wife told me about it immediately when she got home. I took a couple days. Um, before I did anything. And I, I ended up going to see, this was pretty much my best friend at the time. And I went over did to the Matthew 18. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I went to see him and he admitted the whole thing. He was so sorry. Um, and you know what? I believed him. I believed he felt really bad. And at the same time, as soon as I accepted that apology from him, I felt 
very badly because I knew what was about to happen to him. He was going to be removed as an elder. He, he was not going to have that pioneer status. And who, know, who knew what it was going to do to his marriage as well? So I felt a heavy burden, um, but I knew that it had to, you know, that he had to tell his, you know, his body of elders and his congregation what had happened. And he did that. And I verified the story with them to make sure that he didn't leave anything out. And spoke to can, them. can I just say yeah, how please. ironic how ironic it is that the very thing he's joking about not wanting to happen ends up happening exactly. due to the manner in which he says this thing. It's just mind mind blowing, yeah. really. Yeah. Now I had you know I had known him for quite a few years and knew of his weaknesses uh, when he after he had gotten divorced. Um, he was a very friendly guy to the opposite sex. And so I wasn't surprised, but I was very disappointed. And then, like I said, I, it really bothered me because I knew what was about to happen to him. So I, I spoke to his elders. They, they went through the whole story. He had told them everything. And the presiding over basically said to me, well, we've spoken to him. He's very sorry for it. And so, um, we're, we're good. To, we're good to go. And I'm like, we're good to go. I, I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't feel it was my place to ask what was going to happen because it really, although it, it, it was my business, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that I was going to ask. And so we just noticed after four or five months that nothing happened. He was still a pioneer. He was still an elder. So I contacted the circuit overseer and I explained to him what had happened. And, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a problem with my friend. He apologized to me. It's fine. What I have a problem with is that he is still serving as an elder and a pioneer. And he disqualified himself with his actions and he shouldn't be serving in those you know, in those responsibilities any longer. And the circuit overseer agreed. He said, I, don't, I had not heard about this. I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to find out. Long story short, Lloyd, it went on for four years and nothing ever happened. Um, he then told me that my wife and I are going to be moving into your congregation. And I said, oh, really? I said, you know, if I were you, I'd reach out to my wife because this has never been resolved. And I said, I don't think she's going to be very kind to the, you know, to this idea of you moving into our congregation and you being one of her elders. So you better, you better talk to her. Well, we go to a circuit assembly. And I see him there and I talk to him and he says, well, would today be a good time? And I'm like, any time now would be good. You, you've got to make sure that, you know, that you've gotten an apology from her and that she's okay. Um, gotten an apology from her. Sorry. Well, uh, an apology from, he would need to offer an apology. To right. Her, right. Right. Um, because they had never cleared the air fully. They spoke once, but it did not. Um, my wife was too emotionally upset about the whole thing. And uh, she, you know, it, it, it was a, a few minute conversation and it just never got completed. Hmm. So while he's at this circuit assembly, at the end of the day, I see him talking to my wife with his wife right next to him. And I'm like, well, surely he's not talking to her in front of 2,000 people that are walking by. This isn't, this isn't an appropriate setting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and, and so I, so basically I, I asked her when, when we were on our way home, you know, what did he talk about? He, and, you know, did, did he apologize to stuff? And she's like, no, no, he just said hello. And how was I doing? 
And I said, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, I was thinking this in my mind because sure, surely he wouldn't have that conversation right there. Right. <clears throat> well, he is about to move into our congregation and he has not spoken to my wife yet. Now my wife's getting very angry and she's like, no, I'm not going to stand for this. He's not coming into this congregation. And he's never even fully apologized to me. So I get with him on the phone and I said, hey, um, when are you going to do this? Oh, I did at the circuit assembly. I'm like, buddy, you didn't. You couldn't have. Your wife was standing next to you. There was 2,000 people walking by. You didn't. You, didn't, you weren't able to do that. And she says she, you didn't apologize for anything. And he's like, well, I just thought it was water under the bridge. So anyways, um, our elders actually stepped up and they told him that he would not be reappointed as an elder or a pioneer if he moved into our congregation. That was the only thing that was ever done, um, which I was thankful that they at least had the, you know, the backbone to tell him that. But he just didn't move into our congregation. He, he was in a, an adjoining conversation you know, congregation in the same kingdom hall. And he was a pioneer and an elder. So that really, the, the, um, the disfellowshipping issues with my son and the reinstatement issues, and then this thing with, you know, with what was my best friend at the time, it just really got me to thinking. I started watching YouTube channels. I think there was a guy who had one called John Cedar or something like that. So I started watching these, you know, these different YouTube videos and, and, and I started researching it. And I started to learn about the child, you know, sexual abuse and how the handling of that, you know, how that was done, which basically they didn't do anything. So I just lost faith that these were God's people and that he was directing them. Too many important issues, too many life-changing issues for young people and for adults that they had no idea how to handle. And I, I just really lost my faith. And like I said, my son, it turns out, I had a conversation with him because he wasn't really active anymore. He was reinstated, but he didn't want to go to these Zoom meetings at this time, right? This is once COVID hit. And so I was like, you know, what's what's going on? And so he finally said, Dad, he goes, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, it's the first time I heard, is it PIMO? I think is the, is the phrase, right? Physically in, mentally yeah. out. Yeah. And, and I said, son, you're not alone. I said, I, I was, you know, I was really. Oh, so myself. up until that point, you didn't really know that you were on the same page. Correct. That's correct. So uh, before either one of us made, you know, any obvious moves, we had that conversation. We realized that both of us were in the same boat. Mm. Uh, so there's a question I'm dying to ask, by the way, and okay. obviously, you know, your son's privacy is important and you've, yeah. you've expressly not said what, what the disfellowshipping things were, right. but if, if you could kind of rank them alongside what this elder did in essentially sexually harassing your wife, how, how would you rank the elder's actions, bearing in mind he got off scot-free alongside your son's actions because of the added responsibility and the added need to be free from any accusation as an elder is supposed to be. I rank that much more serious, mm -hmm. much more serious than what my son did. I, I, I don't, in fact, I talked to him before, uh, before I joined you on this meeting, my son, that is, <clears throat> And he, he didn't mind, but basically it was just what y young men and women, you know, their hormones raging in their teens and basically. Was a crime committed 
<laughs> um, was anyone sexually assaulted? No. no. Well, there you go. The, <laughs> that's the answer to the question, you know. Yeah. And and in the meantime, you know, my my son's um, discipline was so difficult on him that we worried about suicide. Hmm. And so it, it was just it was just unbelievable. And then, yeah, when you compare it to what, you know, this fellow elder or friend at the time did, again, I always have to remind myself, he apologized to me. He did everything that he was supposed to do in following up and admitting what he had done. I confirm that. It was the body of elders that dealt with that situation. And somehow they talked themselves into the, into the decision that what he did was, was fine because he said he was sorry. It is. He said he was sorry to them, not to her. Correct. He, he did say that well, he, he was apologized sorry. to us. He, and tried. The elders. he tried, but she wasn't ready. And look, mm. um, you know, when, and when the whole thing happened, when he tried to come into our congregation, um, and then the elders told him, well, you'll not be remade an elder. Well, he called me and he was pissed. And, you know, he said, I, I tried everything I could do. And, you know, your, your wife didn't take my apology. And I said, no, you didn't do everything that you could do. And I said, you made your bed and you lie in it and you're suffering the consequences and now you're coming to me angry about it. You are still a elder and a pioneer. And quite frankly, I told him that is ridiculous. You know, you shouldn't be. I said, I stepped down for something that, you know, that I had done that bothered my conscience a little bit. And I, and I went and told them and stepped down and you know, you're, you're having difficulty moving around in congregations now and you're upset. So those were the things that got me headed in the other direction. Mm. And uh, another thing I will say is, is that as soon as we started to have these, um, you know, the, um, the, the broadcasts, and we started seeing these, you know, these brothers and the these body. wise, profoundly knowledgeable, awkward, and, humble. and, and to <laughs> me, mostly um, insincere. Mm. Like I would just listen to the way that they spoke, and I'm like, really? They they don't sound sincere. Mm. And just some of the, you know, the things that some of them said about. Um, I remember we were in the congregation and I think we watched it in the congregation, but it was Tony Morris talking about the tight pants and basically how this, you know, if you dress like that, you've got, uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're friends with the devil. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And so then I, then everything, I started noticing everything uh, those last couple of years and it was a it was a perfect opportunity once I found out where my son was. Also, I knew that my marriage was, you know, was over. And I also knew that my ex-wife would not want to be or would be miserable being married to someone who is now a non-believer. Well, unless she woke up herself. Yeah, but she she came from generations of witnesses, and her family uh, was so powerful in her life. I just knew that was never going to happen. So, I'm only trying to I'm only trying to imagine a variety of possibilities, and and one possibility that does occur to me. You know, now that you are giving this interview under your real name, is that 
maybe at some at some point your ex-wife might want to watch this interview and maybe it might it might prompt some introspection and, and sow some seeds. So you just yeah. never know, do you really? No. And I think as time goes on, you know, and as these so-called prophecies are really unfulfilled, I, I, I see things happening in 20 years to that organization unless they spend something on it. And they've done that in the past where 1975, that whole, you know, prediction of the end of the world didn't happen. They lost quite a few people, but then it also grew very quickly in a short period of time after that. So they're experts in spinning, um, you know, prophecies that don't come true into some other meaning. And they didn't see it until the light got brighter. (laughs) So... But I don't, I don't think people are going to fall for that forever. I think there's going to be a mass exodus. That's my guess. Yeah, well, it would be nice. However, as I've said before on the channel, I think that um, lots of people follow the governing body for reasons other than the chronology. Right. And, you know, if you were to ask, I would, I would say if you were to ask most Jehovah's Witnesses what's the significance of 1919, probably most are going to kind of look at you with like a blank stare and mouth slightly ajar and, oh, what do I say now? Yeah. Um, most people's reasons for following the religion have nothing to do with whether with whether it was actually chosen by God and therefore actually God's one true religion. It's all to do with how it makes them feel and what criteria, self-selected criteria the organization is meeting. And I, and I know just from watching, watching you in the last you know, year or so, mm. I know you and I feel the same way, mm. that there are some lovely people. I've got many friends that I miss. I did end up getting disfellowshipped, by the way. They hounded me until I was just like, look, if it will make you feel better, okay, I'll talk to you. <laughs> but anyways, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends, my whole group of friends for 28 years, and they're gone. Mm. And they're great people, um, but they're still drinking the water and they're not ready. And they may never, you know, they may never be ready. I don't know. Is it, yeah, is it sort that. of, is it sort of post COVID that they hunted you down and disfellowshipped you? Yeah. So no, it was during COVID. I have moved That's from, what I mean. When I say post-COVID, I mean like post okay. it being declared the pandemic. Yeah, It yeah. was, it was. Mm. You know, we started, when COVID hit, you know, we started the Zoom meetings. We weren't meeting at the Kingdom Halls any longer. And so within three months, um, I made that decision right after COVID started in March of 2020 that I was going to leave. And it was also a little easier because it was just, I just wasn't going to be, I also didn't show up on the Zoom meetings. So I I didn't talk about it with anyone at first. My wife was just saying, what are you doing? So um, then I I asked for the divorce. um, And in November um, of last year, I moved back to New Hampshire, which is where I grew up, an area that I grew up. And the original elder who studied with me was still there in the hometown that I moved back to. And he called me on a weekly basis to get a meeting together because the brothers in Phoenix had contacted them. So finally, I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll meet with you. Quite frankly, I was just going to let it go. You know, I, I don't need to hide anything. And I also just... I I don't need to do this, but I'll give you 10 minutes if you'd like to talk with me. So they set up a Zoom meeting with Judicial Committee, and they decided that night, you'll be disfellowshipped. And I said, no problem. I said, I understand. Sorry, it's like that scene in Anchorman, that's escalated quickly. So is is this because you divorced your wife? I'm, I'm just I'm wondering, I'm, obviously, it's probably a, a private thing, but it, it, yes. it's not so, making much sense as to why they would suddenly disfellowship you. 
<laughs> right, right. Yes, it did have to do with that. Right. Uh, basically, I gave my wife her freedom. Right. I. I oh, you know, I, I see. Right. Okay. Well, once okay. I got back so, home, I met a girl, and so. So it's not even though you divorce, even though you divorced your wife she would have been scripturally bound to you and not able to move on with her life unless you gave her evidence of adultery. So that's correct. Okay. And basically that's just, a, yeah. in this form, it was a letter of and an admittance that that's what mm. had happened. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry for kind of, it's one of those things where if I don't ask about it, viewers are going to be like, well, how, how did they suddenly disfellowship him? But no, I appreciate I you sharing that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as you look back on this journey, um, thinking back to, you know, this young lad who's about to go to the police academy, uh, I have to ask if you could step in a, in a time machine or a Doctor Who TARDIS and, and go back to that that year and confront your younger self and say something and maybe maybe even stop them from stop that young man from speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses, would you? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's just no no hesitation, no doubt about it. I would have continued on with my plan. And uh life would have been quite different. I don't but, know. But but would that not have resulted in your son never being born? Right, right. So and I wouldn't have wanted that, obviously. Mm. Um, so I think the way that it has ended is as good as I could hope for under the circumstances. Mm. Uh, my son is newly married, um, a new child on the way. So I'm going to be a grandfather for the first time. And actually the, the girl that he had dated, um, who was a witness at the time, she has also left and they're married now. So very happy for them and very happy to have escaped with only 28 years of wasted time. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't imagine if my son would still be in the organization today. It would be a, a completely different experience for me. Mm. And I know I've watched, you know, I've watched the guests that you've, that you've had and, and you can see how it just tear, tears them apart. And uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate that that didn't happen to me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's quite some story. And again, I'm very appreciative to you for, sharing so much and i'm glad that even though like you say 28 years in a cult you do have your your son uh you have his you know young family his young and growing family um and you have you know you you're not being shunned by parents or anything so there's lots to be grateful for uh, if you had any any message for someone who's um perhaps on the fence about the religion or whether they should um, take a look at objective criticism of the religion, what would be your advice? My advice would be to research it from all angles and from all sources and never, never be talked into just listening to one source and to not even listen not even listen or you just may, you know, the devil will come in and, you know, influence you in, in bad ways. Um, research it from all angles. Um, listen to what fellow witnesses have been through. Um, get the good, the bad and the ugly and make a wise decision. Very good advice. Well, thank you so much, Oliver, for uh, sharing this story and sharing your time. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Floyd. Appreciate you having me. Thanks. So, viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this interview. I certainly have. Don't forget that you can enjoy more such videos by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.